All right, everybody, so much art history and never enough time to cover it all. So let's go run through the art museum. Our next chapter is chapter 27. So as a reminder, write the page number that we start this chapter on in your table of contents. Up in the header, I want you to write the title of this chapter. You can either write chapter 27, you can write 27, or you can write 19th century art. This is a reminder, five hand-drawn sketches per chapter. Are we good with this? Ready to move on? <clears throat> All right, so we've got uh, just a recap of what we've been looking at <clears throat> lately or this semester. Uh, with the 16th century, that's the Cinquecento uh, Italian Renaissance and also Northern Renaissance, but we had Renaissance uh, over here. Then we looked at Baroque art and then we looked at the Rococo and we started, we ended the 1700s or we ended the 18th century with revolution in, uh, in, in France with the neoclassical era. So that kind of sets us up for big changes in the 19th century. And those changes are technological, governmental and social changes. Are we good to go? All right, so think about it. Like for thousands of years, the way to get around, the way to travel from one point to another is either to walk or by some sort of a horse or even, you know, on a boat. But it, transportation hasn't changed much in thousands of years. So from thousands of years ago up until 1800, transportation hasn't changed much. But within the next hundred years, people are going to be taking trains and cars and planes. And so there's going to be huge changes, uh, you know, with the next 100 to 120 years. Think about communication. How long does it take to get a communication? Like when you want to communicate with somebody that is far away, how long do, will it take for your letter to get there? Because there's no phones, there's no internet, there's no, um, uh, uh, there's not even any pagers, all right, which is before your time. But anyway, um, so you had to send a letter and that letter goes by horse or it goes by ship. And it could be that, you know, it takes days to get there. It takes weeks to get there. It even takes months for your communication to get where it's going. All right. And within so that has been the standard of communication for thousands of years up to the 1800s. But between 1800 and, you know, 19 uh, and 1900, we have this huge change in communication. You can communicate instantly with people that are a long distance away through the telegraph and then even the telephone. Another big change that has happened is that uh, for thousands of years, the main system of government has been kings and queens or emperors. For thousands of years, most governments in the world have been based on a monarchy. But within 100 years, we're going to have the democracies rise up and even Marxism and communism rise up. So we have a huge change in governments, uh, government styles, 
come up. For thousands of years, most people have lived an agrarian lifestyle. Have, most people are involved with uh, uh, planting fields and uh, harvesting crops so that people can eat. And that's been the major lifestyle for most people for thousands of years. Nothing's really changed. But between 1800 and 1900, we have the Industrial Revolution and people move from uh, uh, these, this agrarian rural lifestyle into the cities and they get jobs in factories. And they have this, and I have the photograph in the lower right, people living in a city at that time. So major changes happening with where people live. Another huge change is that for thousands of years, almost everything that is made has been made by a person's hand. You know, we have this guy who's a, a cobbler and he's making shoes. And this one guy in his little shop makes shoes and that's where you get your shoes from. But then we have these factories, you know, that you go from your shoes being made by one guy to your shoes being made by a factory. And so how this affects art, there's huge changes in art as well. So for thousands of years, artists have basically worked with the same rules of painting and sculpture is to make things look realistic. And so we have uh, this painting on the left, with the, which is, uh, I think, late Egyptian uh, and early Roman. Um, but it, it follows the same rules of making it look realistic. And up until, you know, 1800s, they're all following the same rules of art. But within 100 years, we have this major shift in art where we go into modernism. And uh, so we have this um, uh, artwork looks very, very different within the next 100 years. So we're going to see a lot of major changes coming, happening right after each other. And one of the things, you know, I, some, like I said, there's lots of changes ahead. And I was watching a, uh, a, an art historian talk about how exciting all these changes are. That's what he loves. And what, you know, one of my favorite periods is modern art, which is, uh, it'll be unit four. And one of the things that I like most about it, it's almost like fireworks going off where we have, you know, for, Let's take the Egyptians, like the Egyptian art, nothing changed for 3,000 years. And then we take this little selection of modern art between 1900 and even like 1960, and we just have one change after another within 60 years. And there's so, there's so many thing, different things going on. It's like fireworks going off. So these changes are deep and permanent, and they will alter the world as have never been seen before. And uh, the art of the period is fascinating. So many deep and insignificant rapid changes in art, and art is going to reflect those rapid changes that are happening in history. So we're going to start this era by uh, finishing our neoclassical uh, uh, art um, and but this it neoclassicism changes under Napoleon. So we're going to be looking at art under Napoleon for a little bit. Are we good? All right, so we are in France. We're going to focus on France for a little bit. And so France, the borders of France are a little bit different than what we know now, but basically it's kind of the same. So we're looking at France here. And the reason why we're going to focus on France is that it is the most powerful nation in Europe at this time. But France is in turmoil. 
All right, so we left off with the French Revolution last unit. And it changed the face of modern politics across Europe and the world. It overturned the monarchy as government and it drew, introduced ideas of liberty and equality and human and civil rights. And it ushered in a world where people saw themselves as, a, as members of a community instead of the subjects of a king. But also during this time, there's a lot of food shortages high taxes to pay for Louis the 16th and who had made massive debts. Louis the 16th charged high taxes in order to pay for his debts. He was mismanaging the money and he was uh, uh, making the nation go broke. So in order to make that money back, he was charging everybody else more to pay in taxes. So there are several political events that Louis, Louis XVI stationed troops around Paris and it sparked anger in people and they stormed the Bastille, uh, which is a, a significant event in the French Revolution. And in the end, absolutionist authoritarian government was replaced by an absol absolutist authoritarian, author authoritarian government. They got rid of an authoritarian, author, authoritarian government and replaced it with an authoritarian government. The just one was, was a monarchy and the other one was not. All right, it was the new government was just as bad as the old government. And during this time, we had the reign of terror. So anybody that was an aristocrat uh, was sent to the uh, to execution by a guillotine. And so uh, lots and lots of people uh, lost their lives to the guillotine. And um, it was a really horrific uh, time. And I was watching about this. It, the, the new government was so fanatical that if you were not as fanatical as them, you were seen as the enemy of the state. And that even if you were on their side, but you didn't believe in like how far they were going, you were in danger of being arrested and uh, executed. So it was it was a, a really horrible time in French history. Anyways, we ended up uh, last semester with this neoclassicism, but this neoclassicism that we looked at was mostly about the revolution. It was about democracy. And the neoclassicism that we're going to, this should say neoclassicism part two, uh, is mostly about the empire. So after Napoleon comes to power, neoclassicism is all about the empire. All right, so then let's talk a little bit about Napoleon. Napoleon is an artillery commander during the revolution and in a couple of skirmishes, he showed himself to be a total badass. He was able to um, uh, stave off the, uh, the royalists from storming the, um, the, the new government. So he uh, and his um, artillery did an amazing job and so he rose up through the ranks and and this is where we get the new the first french republic so this is the new government but there was a problem with napoleon so he you know he was a military genius which was good and he did some amazing things that the army hadn't been able to do before but he started saying like crazy things you know he uh uh for example he, my notes here say uh, his army fighting for the French government was a little bit too good. And it was so good that it was scary. Napoleon was ruthless. He was competent, but he was ambitious. And he was good at self-aggrandizing uh, propaganda. And he began to compare himself to Caesar. And he compared himself to Alexander the Great. And he compared himself to Octavian. Uh, uh, Roman emperor. And so that made the new French government kind of scared of 
of Napoleon. And so one of the, the ideas that Napoleon comes up with is that he thinks that it would be a good idea to invade Egypt. And the new government thinks that's a good idea because that will get him away from France for a while. And, uh, you know, he might even die in the battle. So, um, so they, he goes to Egypt and I think his campaign lasts like three years and it's a, uh, it's kind of, it's a rough campaign, but you get a lot of these, uh, these romantic images of, uh, uh, these Europeans in a foreign land. Um, and like I said, Egypt is a foreign land to France. Uh, these paintings represent the romantic view of the Napoleon in Egypt, but really Napoleon had a very difficult time in Egypt and he was defeated in Egypt and he comes back and he returns home after his Egyptian campaign and he rises up through the ranks of the army and he joins a group to overthrow the government. So that fear that they have of him being too ambitious was certainly a, uh, a a realistic fear because he did actually overthrow the government and he becomes the first consul. It's like the leader of France. And again, he is a genius military mastermind and he's also a ruthless and power hungry tyrant. So during his leadership, Napoleon attacks Prussia, which is like Germany. He attacks Austria. Napoleon attacks Italy, Napoleon attacks Spain, and Napoleon attacks Russia. And so this creates the first French empire. So, you know, France grows from this to this. And most of Europe is under control of Napoleon. And I'm going to stop there for today. We'll get into some more works tomorrow.
Thank you. 